speaker is Nabil Matar, uh, who is from, uh, who's coming to us from Minnesota. He's a very, very good friend and brother of mine. Um, he is, uh, I can say a lot about him. I limit myself to the text I have, but maybe at some point I'll add a few things. But uh, the topic today is Europe through Arab eyes, encounters in the early modern uh, period. And um, the book that's assigned to go with the lecture ha is also um, uh, Europe through Arab eyes, 1578, 1727. And I don't know whether it's available on sale after this event or not, but. Uh, uh, it might be. If it is, I highly recommend it. And Nabil Matar uh, studied English literature at the American University of Beirut, where he received his BA and MA. In 1976, he completed his PhD at Cambridge University on the poetry of Thomas Trahern. I can't pronounce his name very correctly. He taught at Jordan University and the American University of Beirut and received postdoctoral grants from the British Council. Clare Hall, Cambridge University, and from uh, Fulbright, Harvard Divinity School. In 1986, Dr. Matar moved to the United States and started teaching in the Humanities Department at Florida Institute of Technology. And I visited, my family and I, we paid him a visit uh, many years ago. In 1997, he became the department head and served until 2007 when he moved to the English department at the University of Minnesota. He is presidential professor in the President's Interdisciplinary Initiative on Arts and Humanities and teaches in the departments of English and History and in the Religious Studies program. Dr. Matar's research in the past two decades has focused on relations between early modern Britain, Western Europe, and the Islamic Mediterranean. And I have to say, in my, in my opinion, he is the world's foremost scholar and researcher in this area. There's no one uh, comparable to him, in my estimation. Uh, he is author of numerous articles, chapters in books and encyclopedias, and the trilogy Islam in Britain, 1558-1685, published by Cambridge University Press, Turks, Moors, and Englishmen in the Age of Discovery, published by Columbia University Press in 1999, and Britain on Barbary, 1589-1689, published by the University Press of Florida in 2005. He wrote the introduction to Piracy, Slavery, and Redemption, published by Columbia University Press in 2001, and, be and began a second trilogy on Arabs and Europeans in the early modern world. In the Lands of the Christians, published in 2003 by Rutledge, Europe Through Arab Eyes, which is associated with this lecture tonight, published by Columbia University Press in 2009. Uh, and he's currently working on the third installment Arabs and Europeans, 1517-1798. With Professor Gerald MacLean, he published Britain and the Islamic World, 1558-1713, Oxford University Press, 2011. And with Professor Judy Hayden, he edited a collection of essays on travel to the Holy Land in the early modern period, which is actually in press. His coming from Brill, forthcoming from Brill in 2012, I guess soon. His forthcoming publication is a study and an annotated ed edition of Henry Stubb and the Prophet Muhammad, the original and progress of Mohammedanism, which is an old, a manuscript that he discovered and now he is annotating and, 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 and editing, coming from Columbia University Press very shortly. He is completing a work on names and numbers, British captives in North Africa, 1578, 1727, in recognition of his pioneering scholarship on the relationship between Islamic civilization and early modern period, Dr. Matar was given the Building Bridges Award at the University of Cambridge last month. Uh, please uh, help me in welcoming Nabil Matar to the podium. I'm Thank you so much, Anwar. This is most gracious of you. Uh, Anwar and I are very good friends but you don't want to sit with us when we're having discussions because we disagree on everything. And poor Melissa, his wife, had to endure the first kind of dinner we had a couple of nights ago because that was just a constant kind of disagreement. But that makes us the better friends. So it has been wonderful to know him and to know his family. And I'm very grateful and honored to be here at the University of New England. It's my first visit to Portland. It is an absolutely gorgeous, 
town or city. Today I had a discussion with a waiter whether it's a town or a city. We agreed it's a city, but has a feel it has the feeling of a town, which is absolutely lovely. The one complaint I have about it is that the restaurants are just absolutely amazing. You come here, you can't but gain weight rather than lose it. So, uh, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate that. Uh, and my paper today is based, well, I'll be getting to that illustration in a little while, but my paper today is part of the last kind of unit in the trilogy I'm preparing, which is about Arabs and Europeans from 1517 to 1798. As you notice from my titles, I'm very meticulous about dates, although I understand fully dates do not kind of separate, I'm not major divisions occur as dates take place, but it kind of gives us the parameters in which uh, we can operate. And I think some dates are very, very important. I'll be explaining that in a little while. Uh, I'm going to start, actually, by a few explanations, given the title of the lectures, which is Arabs and Europeans of the Early Modern Period. And so I'm going to start because, you know, basically, what do these terms mean? Uh, nowadays, terms are very, very fluid, and they're constantly being negotiated in terms of how we understand those terms. So I'm going to start with the term Arab and how I'm using it in this paper and in the project I have. And basically, I'm using it as a linguistic category without any of the 19th or the 20th century uh, implications of nationalism, which emerged much later. Arabs were those who spoke and wrote in Arabic, both Christians and Muslims. The early modern, the term early modern, again, perhaps some of you who are my generation or younger would remember that you know, when I studied and finished my doctorate, we were still using the term Renaissance, and then it was changed to early modern. Uh, whether the early modern applies in the context of Arab Islamic civilization is obviously a different question. But again, I want to define that, because early modern period, you know, historians, at least in the Western tradition, have associated the rise of the early modern with the development of Eurocentrism. As Europe's religious and military expansion was launched, the history of all parts of the world with which Europeans came in contact, whether by conquest, as in the Americas, or by trade and military conflict, as in North Africa and the Middle East, became Eurocentric. From this perspective, the year 1492, for numerous historians, marked the birth of modernity. But for the peoples of the Arabic-speaking world, the conquest of America had no impact. Rather, it was the conquest of their lands by the Ottomans in 1517 that changed the course of their history. In that year, 1517, Ottoman armies conquered Syria, Palestine, and then Egypt, all the way to Algeria, a name actually coined by the, uh, by the Ottomans. They never touched Morocco, so that's why Anwar is always very proud of that. So 1517 is the beginning, while the terminus at Quem uh, is the year 1798. That's the kind of the parameter within which I'm working, and the Napoleonic invasion, which brought about transformations in Arabic civilization and Arab society. And basically, Albert Ferrani, Edward Said, and many historians would kind of recognize the Napoleonic invasion as a major transformation in the history of the Arabic East. Europe. There were two Europes which were encountered by two different Arabic-speaking communities. There was Western Europe that comprised France and Spain, Malta and Italy, with England becoming a strong contender from the early 17th century on. And there was Eastern Europe which comprised Russia. It is necessary to start, however, with an admission. Arabs did not leave behind extensive writings about Europe and Europeans. They wrote by far less than Europeans wrote about them. Explanations as to why this, they did not produce more accounts have varied, with some historians advancing the psychological absence of curiosity among Muslims, and others crediting Islamic narrowness to the injunctions of jurists, especially the Malikis of North Africa. Such explanations are inadequate. The reason why Arabs and Muslims in general wrote little about Europeans was a result of their infrequent travels to European countries. 
And the reason why they traveled infrequently was not psychological or theological. Travel to Christendom nearly always took place aboard European ships, which ships were reluctant to provide infidels, as they called them, with means of transportation. The Magariba, for instance, people of Western North Africa, uh, preferred, I mean, the Magariba always preferred European ships over their own because they knew that European ships were better, better built. English, Dutch, and French ships were built to sail in the rough Atlantic and Indian Oceans. Those ships were also more capable of defending themselves against attacks by pirates than Magariba ships. Europeans were fully aware of this preference and manipulated relations by providing or denying travelers, traders, and envoys access to their ships. By so doing, Europeans controlled the number, frequency, and possibility of Arab visits. Muslims from both the Mashraq, kind of Middle East, and the Maghreb, Western North Africa, were at the mercy of Europeans, since they could neither visit nor conduct diplomatic, commercial, or religious activities independent of the transporters. Which is why it was a Christian Arabic or an Arab Christian clergyman, and they alone, all the clergymen, who were able to spend long periods of time and to visit Rome or Paris or Moscow. Europeans were willing to grant passes to Christians from the East in a manner that they did not to Muslims. It is this factor that explains why the longest travel account in all early modern Arabic travel literature about Europe, basically about Russia, was written by a Christian Arab of the Antiochian Patriarchy in Aleppo. It also explains why the first account about America in Arabic was by a Catholic priest, Hanna al-Musli. Had he not been Catholic, he would not have been permitted to board a Spanish ship and sailed to America in 1688. It was basically Mexico and kind of Central America. It doesn't kind of move further north. And then basically write an account, the first account in Arabic that has at least survived about uh, America. Which is why even a century later, by the kind of second half of the 18th century, the only information that a Muslim ambassador to Spain had about Marca, as he calls America, came from hearsay. He seemed to have heard from his kind of uh, hosts about the initial discovery of the continent and the revolt of the colonies against Britain, kind of in the uh, 1770s, along with the Boston Tea Party episode. Even if he had wanted to travel, he would not have had the means or the permission to pass the port by the colonists, the passport that you needed. Arguments about the lack of curiosity toward the West among early modern Muslims and Eastern Christians ignore the simple fact of lack of accessibility. So what sources are there for the study of Europe through Arab eyes? Notwithstanding paucity, there are the following clusters. First, pilgrimage accounts, chiefly by Christians who went to Moscow, Rome, and other sites of holiness in Europe, and we're going to be looking at one of them today. Travel accounts written by ambassadors reporting back to their courts. They also include accounts by young men, chiefly Catholics, who from the 16th century on went to Europe to pursue higher education. In 1584, the establishment of the Maronite College in Rome opened the door for novices and priests from Lebanon and Syria to study translate, edit, and print material in Arabic, Latin, and Syriac. Third, Muslim jurisprudential decisions, nawazil. In the course of resolving a legal conundrum, jurists had to describe the situation and invoke precedence. In the case of captives and their uh, spouses, their resolutions included information about the condition of captivity, the perpetrators, the destination to which captives were taken, and the socio-religious environment in which they found themselves. And these decisions are very interesting because 
you know, whenever a jurist had a case, a woman would come or a man would come and tell him, you know, I was held captive and then I came back and my wife is remarried since, you know, I was away for so many years. So what the jurist will have to do is put down all the kind of decisions that had taken place by prior jurists and then put down his own decision. And in order to put down his own decision, he had to describe the situation, where this man had gone, what had happened to him, how long he had stayed in captivity, what kind of environment he was in. So basically, you find very, very kind of clear passages about areas of Western Europe in which Muslim captives were held. Number four, oral communication. The Arabs of North Africa learned about European affairs from the hundreds of laborers, resident workers, merchants, and converts who lived among them from Tangier to Tripoli in Lebanon. As early as the mid 1570s, the Moroccan ruler, Muhammad al Mutawakkil, wrote to Queen Elizabeth I of England, telling her how he wanted to continue the good relations with all Englishmen in his realm, in Morocco. The, and, and then he describes who these Englishmen are, I quote in translation, the traveler and the resident the exporter and the importer, the virtuous and the libertine, must have been having a good time there, the buyer and the trader, end of quote. Meanwhile, in Christian regions, the local populations met and learned about Europeans from missionaries, ecclesiastical envoys, and uh, ascetes, mahabis, who, men basically who sought caves in Mount Lebanon and Palestine to live in meditation. There are numerous references to particularly Frenchmen coming to Lebanon and Palestine and kind of finding their way around into a cave and living there. And then after their death, there are records about their lives in the Arabic sources. Finally, kind of the fifth source uh, are correspondence. And these are of two categories. First are the royal and ambassadorial correspondences. Hundreds of letters have survived of exchange at the level of rulers. In North Africa, such letters were often read in mosques and Sufi circles in order to alert the population from pious worshipers to seafaring privateers about relations with a particular country. And in those letters, it's very interesting always to look at the introductions, because if the introduction is very elaborate, praising the, uh, the monarch of the European country, it means the relations are good. If it's very abrupt as a start, then it means the relations are very flawed. So in a sense, these letters are very significant because they were widely distributed. And the second set of correspondence are personal correspondence. Unfortunately, the personal letters that have survived are few and far between, especially those that report on relations at a level beyond the public and the international. So this evening, I'll present two examples from the above sources about two, in my view, unusual travelers. The first is drawn from a pilgrimage travelogue account, and the second is from personal letters, rare as they are. The first will examine the writings of a Christian, the second the writings of a Muslim. Both wrote in Arabic and were contemporaries, but living far apart. The first in Aleppo, in Syria, and the second in Meknes, in Morocco. The first went to Moscow, the second went to Paris. The first was a priest, the second was an ambassador. The first had a shattering experience with a Russian woman. The second fell in love with the wife of his French host, but he behaved himself. The priest. Boulos, that's his name, Paul Boulos, was a priest of the Antiochian Orthodox Church who traveled with his father in the 1650s to Moscow. Like others who went on pilgrimages and visitations, Boulos became exposed to different regions and peoples, both inside and outside the Ottoman Empire. The account that he wrote of his travels to and in Russia is the most informative travelogue in Arabic of the early modern period, and the longest personal narrative. It's 636 pages in the manuscript at the Bibliothèque Nationale. There's nothing like it about any other European country. Boulos belonged to the Orthodox community of the East. These Orthodoxyin, as they were called, the Orthodox, of the Ottoman Empire, often visited co-religionists, holy sites, the tombs of pious patriarchs, and churches. 
They went, sometimes in large groups, as in one quotation in his text, singing hymns and praising God, either in the direction of Jerusalem or St. Catherine's Monastery in Mount Sinai or out of the empire, chiefly towards Russia if they are Orthodox or towards France and Italy if they were Catholic. The community, in this case the Orthodox community, was spread out. And the stops that Boulos recounted in his travelogue show many small pockets of Christians around the empire in a manner that's no longer positive, possible after the national states of today. They felt no more danger as Christians than others who traveled and suffered from highway robbers, shortage in provisions, and bad weather. Boulos and his companions crisscrossed from Aleppo to Damascus to Jerusalem and then back to Aleppo and then westward toward Moscow via Konya in Turkey, Anatolia. There they found that the dervishes at Darawish had great mahabba, love, and the quotation is mahabba for the Nasara and the monks, mahabba for the Nasara and the Ruhban, the monks, the Nasara meaning Christians. On reaching Istanbul, they visited the mosque of Hagia Sophia, where they saw above the mihrab, the direction of prayer in a mosque, two verses from the Quran about the Virgin Mary, from uh, the Surah Imran 37 39. The Ottoman transformation of the cathedral into a mosque had added Islamic piety to Christian iconography. But their destination was Russia, one of the places that the Orthodox Arabs came to know well. The Russian Orthodox Church had had a long relationship with Syria and Palestine and their holy sites. Since early medieval times, Russian and Ukrainian and other Slavic pilgrims visited those sites as well as sites in Sinai. At the same time that Tsars sent emissaries to distribute alms to the local congregations. These visits continued after the Ottoman conquest of Constantinople and the Eastern Mediterranean because the Russians saw Jerusalem and other biblical locations both as sacred sites of historical value as well as symbols of the heavenly Jerusalem and the promise of salvation. Although Boulos was going as part of a delegation to Moscow in quest of financial support for his church, it's interesting that a large crowd of the poor, al-fuqara, as he puts it in his text, joined in, having with them letter patents from their patriarchs in Constantinople and Jerusalem to seek alms. Also, there were travelers who went not just as alms seekers, but also as traders. They took money with them to buy, and I quote, sables, ermines, and such like, that they may realize a great profit on their sale in Turkey. It's upon this principle that most of them come, end of quote. Profit seemed to be as important as piety in the Christian journey to Russia. Boulos wrote about the food and the weather, the political and military alliances and conflicts, the relationship of local princes to the Tsar, the complex ecclesiastical establishment and its hierarchy, and the various ethnic groups that he encountered. He wrote in Arabic, sometimes adding Greek to explain religious terms. He was observant and truthful, but what's quite striking about his account is the light it sheds on how an Eastern Orthodox from Islamic Aleppo saw himself in relation to what he called the country of the Christian, Bilad al Nasara. At the outset, Boulos was effusive in his expectations regarding, and I quote, monarchs and the pious princes who are celebrated for their true religion and sincere faith. May God continue their empire and perpetuate their dynasty. May he confirm their existence and eternize in the zenith of splendor the towers of their felicity. And of course, after all, he and his delegation were going into a region of wealth into which they hoped to tap. Also a region of relics. Nowhere else, at least not in the Islamic East, would he be able to venerate, as he lists, the leg of Saint Marina, or the bone of Saint Chrysostom, and another of Saint Gregory Theologos, or some blood of Anastasius the Persian, and some of Flacius, Bishop of Sebastia. And of course, Russia for him was a land of saints. But as the journey progressed, and much as he admired a lot of what he saw, 
he found himself becoming very conscious of his different cultural and geographical identity. At the imperial court in Moscow, he was happy to help in translation from Turkish to Greek. But when he was asked whether he would like to stay there, his answer was prompt. And I quote, though you made me a present of all Moscow, I would not stay, end of quote. He felt very much a leper. And when he saw several fish ponds, he could not but recall the Sheikh Abu Bakr ponds in Aleppo. Whenever he mentioned the Ottoman Sultan, he added, whom God preserve. For he was proud of Ottoman military might, especially recalling the victory over Baghdad in 1638 and the fear that victory instilled in subject provinces in the hinterlands. His knowledge of Turkish made him feel sympathetic to the Muslim Tatars whom he met. Although he was surprised to see them, Muslims taking off their kalpaks in the presence of Christians, he was eager to talk to them, since they were familiar, as he said, with our country and Damascus." End of quote. Meanwhile, he sometimes felt alienated from his foreign surroundings. He was unhappy that all information about the progress of the Russian Tsar was viewed as a state secret to which he and his companions were not given access, being non-Moscovites. And there was the long Russian liturgies, tiring and tedious. As he said, quote, severe enough to turn children's hair gray. End of quote. <laughs> what may have sealed his alienation was his realization that the Russians, fellow Orthodox as they were, were different, both in ecclesiastical as well as in social custom and tradition. A shattering encounter took place with a Russian woman, a woman who shared Boulos's religion, but not his Middle Eastern culture. And I quote, and now I have to mention a strange thing, which I witnessed on this occasion, a thing which we had been told of, but which we would not believe. I saw it, however, with my own eyes, and it was this. After the table was set, and we had taken our places at the board, the voivode, the governor, called in his wife, who came in her finest dress with her daughters and little boys, bowing her head to us as she entered and saluting us. Then the governor placed her in the middle of the room and begged us to go and kiss her on the mouth with the holy Pascal kiss, in the virtue of which they have the highest faith. I turned into a mute statue and was melting away in a fever of bashfulness. In vain, the husband urged me vehemently. I still held back until at length they got the dragomans, the translators, to prevail on me and to go and kiss the lady by representing to me that otherwise the governor, her husband, would be seriously affronted, overcome with shame and pushed forward with some violence, I advanced to the lady and kissed her mouth. <laughs> and she kissed mine, saying, Christos Voskros. I was, as it were, without sight or sense. So great was my confusion amidst a scene I had never before witnessed." End of quote. Christian society in Aleppo was integrated within the mores and value systems of the Islamic majority where women were not available for such embrace. The behavior of the Russians deeply challenged his cultural norms, which may explain why Boulos was very happy about returning to, as he called it, my country, Beledna. There was difference between the orthodoxy of Russia and of his homeland. While there was difference with the Russians, there was commonality among the different religious communities in the Ottoman world. As Boulos noted, Muslims, Christians, and Jews went to the shrine of Sheikh Abu Bakr, the guy with the ponds in Aleppo, to celebrate the arrival of special water brought from Persia to repel locusts. At the head of the procession were the Muslims who were singing, then the Christians who were chanting in Greek. And altogether, they went around the wall of the city in a most, as he said, orderly fashion. Boulos cherished such manifestations of interreligious activities, especially around saints venerated by Muslims and Christians alike. Perhaps none better demonstrates this interfellowship 
than the stunning icon of the Silesian Simon the Elder and Simon the Younger, painted by Naimi al Musawir in 1699 for the Church of Notre Dame de Bellement in Northern Lebanon. That is the, uh, as you can see, uh, to the left of the column, now this is the icon and the challenge of ah. And this is kind of the corner to the left, as you can see. To the left of the Ottoman uh, column of Simon the Elder, there's an Arab gentleman with a servant who approaches the same with raised hands. This, ap this Arab appears to be importuning the saints, a reflection, perhaps a reflection, of current Muslim veneration for holy Christian ascetics. He is standing at a distance. You can see that is where he is. He's standing kind of at a distance from the columns, but his hand is gesturing in the direction of the older Simeon, and his eyes are looking up. The influence of Russian iconography, of course, is quite evident in this painting icon. As Gra Russia grew into a European power by the early 18th century, the Orthodox Union, the Orthodox, continued to look to it for assistance, and they grew in their admiration. A description of Russia written just about 100 years after Bulos, 1758 or thereabout, was fulsome in its praise, not only of Russia, but of all Europe. The author stated, it's probably a priest, anonymous, that his book was taken from the writings of numerous travelers, all of whom concurred, and I translate, that those who have this diagrammed the earth, the historians, the lawmakers, the dealers with civic matters, the famous heroes, and the technologically advanced in warfare are all from Europe. The author wanted to write a history of Russia and other countries and peoples of the world to describe, as he said, their fruit and fertility, seas and lakes, and all forts, courts, churches, and temples. He opened with praise of the Europeans, Ahel Europa, who, according to all historians, he affirmed, quote, are gentle and well-mannered, more so than all other rough peoples inhabiting the third part of the world. They are kind and they love strangers and other courteous greeting, offer courteous greetings. They tend to mercy, justice, and generosity, have affable faces, and have a way of action and thinking, which they have learned either from habit or education." End of quote. The religions of the Europeans are first and best Christianity, which is in three groups, Eastern, Western, and Lutheran, Calvinist. He seems to be aware of the difference between the two. Then the religion of the Ottomans and of the Jews. Not only were Europeans better than the other peoples of the earth, but indeed it was because they had attained success, Najah, that they had been able, again quote, to conquer other kingdoms in the other hemisphere, where they have imposed their laws on people, taught them their crafts and sciences, and subdued them by the strength of their technology and their industry of war, end of quote. Specifically about the Russians, the author praised their physical prowess, their strength, their eating habits, houses, and feasts. To his and his readers, Russia and the rest of Europe had become models of modernity. The ambassador. While Boulos wrote a travelogue, the ambassador wrote letters, a unique body of which has survived at the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. The name of this Moroccan ambassador was Abdullah ibn Aisha, and the letters were exchanged with the wife of his French host, Madame Jourdain, and of course with her husband, uh, Monsieur Jourdain. I dealt briefly with this episode in previous work, the work of Europe Through Arab Eyes. Last summer, I came across further twists to this story. In 1699, an amazing marriage proposal was made. Moulay Ismail, the ruler of Morocco, sent the ambassador, Abdullah ibn Aisha, to negotiate a military and commercial alliance with France. He proposed to seal the alliance by marriage between him, Ismail, and one of the illegitimate daughters of King Louis XIV, the Princess de Conti. Such a move did not seem odd in the Mediterranean, where many sea captains and rulers from Tetuan to Tripoli, had been immigrant Europeans who had converted to Islam and settled among their new co-religionists. 
The wives of these Europeans turned North Africans, Christians turned Muslims, could well have been Irish, their wine Spanish, their, and they drank work, their cheese and clocks French, their ships Dutch, their tobacco and cannons English, and their pilots Flemish or Italian, Maltese or Portuguese. Ismail was going beyond the Christian Islamic divide. He promised that his French bride would have her own palace, run her own affairs, and keep her own religion, which was more than the Huguenots had been allowed a decade earlier in France. The speech that Ibn Aisha delivered before the French king in Paris captures the moment when an Arab Muslim potentate thought that he might join with European Christendom in creating a new Mediterranean. The friendship between Morocco and France, Ibn Aisha said, and I translate, will bring about peace and tranquility to the people after such a long war. That is what will make the Moors French and the French Moors." End of quote. The speech expressed the hope for inter-identification between the Maghariba and the French, the Muslim and the Christian, effecting thereby a transformation of identities and realizing an engagement rather than a clash of civilizations in the Mediterranean. The marriage proposal was turned down, but despite the failure, a deep friendship developed between Ibn Aisha and the family of Louis Jourdain. After his return to Morocco, Ibn Aisha wrote back to the Jourdain family in gratitude and appreciations. The letters that have survived from April 1699 to July 1700 are in Arabic, copied and translated into French. They include discussions of business and scientific affairs and conclude in a startling moment of what uh, Albert Harani called Arabo-Latin harmony. At the start, on 12 April 1699, Jourdain wrote to Ibn Aisha telling him that he wanted to start a business in Saleh under Ibn Aisha's auspices. The goal was to sell French manufactured products and buy Moroccan agricultural goods. In the letter, Jourdain explains to the Moroccan about the changes in the world's new economic order. More cultivation, he wrote, will require more labor which leads to more employment, and thus richer harvests of wheat. Those harvests will satisfy national food needs and provide an export commodity to France that will enrich the Moroccan coffers. What Jourdain was proposing, he explained, was not a new fangled idea, but one that had been practiced by the greatest empires of the past, including the Roman Empire. It's not clear how much Ibn Aisha and Mulai Ismail, to whom the ambassador reported every move and every word, heeded Jourdain's advice. But at least they were learning about Roman historical precedents and how European agriculture, population control, and capitalism were changing. He was also learning about ways and means to curb internal dissent. And I translate. In all the histories that I have read, I have found that all the rebellions and revolts that occur in a land stems from the unemployment of people. That's why the ancient Romans, who were famous for their sound administration and policy in their dominions, when they were on peaceful terms with their neighbors and not at war with others, used to send tribes and peasants into the wastelands. They settled them there to cultivate the lands and revive them. And in that way, they brought prosperity to their dominions. At the same time, they kept their armies busy in digging roads, cutting through mountains, routing rivers or rerouting rivers, building bridges, and digging canals to take water to arid regions. I suspect that your glorious king, may God keep him victorious, might in his noble person le lean to such a policy, seeing how he always re requests builders from France. Ibn Aisha replied by expressing fear that Europeans would begin by buying the grain, i.e. the French, but then at a later point move to occupy the region that produced the grain. He feared that conquest followed trade. And of course, we've seen that in America. In order to allay those fears, Jourdain sent him a letter in February 1700 in which he furnished him with a comparison and contrast of European strategies. It was a letter of information regarding continental differences in which he emphasized Jourdain France's benign ideology. Again, I quote, if you look at the state of the English and the Flemish and, they, and at the riches of their possessions, 
you will see that they have seized the richest lands in India and elsewhere in the world. But they seek to increase their wealth more than they intend to do good to people or to build up the countries where they sell their commodities. They plan to conquer all the lands in which they trade. The French, on the other hand, are different because we bring prosperity to the people with whom we trade. This is our goal in Saleh and elsewhere, and of course. In a letter sent in, 17, in March 1700, Jordan informed Ibn Aisha of King Louis' plans to colonize regions in, South, in the South Sea, inhabited by some Spaniards and, as he said, savage tribes of people like demons, Efreets. Not only was the Frenchman teaching the, Mor the Moroccan to view peoples about whom the latter knew nothing as savages and dangerous, he was also justifying imperial conquest on racial grounds. And that is kind of interesting because Mulai Ismail himself, the ruler, was half black. Meanwhile, other letters include information about astronomy, exhibiting the respect that the French had for Moroccan scientific inquiry. Maghariba had no problem discussing scientific and medical lore with their European counterpart, since by its very nature, as one Arab writer said, such lore was elm mushtara, common knowledge. In this case, the French were keeping track of Moroccan findings at the same time that Ibn Aisha learned about French astronomical developments uh, and instruments. One letter praised Ibn Aisha, we don't know it's an anonymous letter, praised Ibn Aisha for the interest he had shown in Dar al Ras, the observatory in Paris. The ambassador, the letter continued, and I quote, inquired in, in detail about the instruments and their operations, and then mentioned that in the city of Marrakesh and other cities of Morocco, there were numerous schools for this art. During certain months of every year, you, Moroccans, assembled to compare the ARSA, the results of your observatories, with each other and to arrive at the necessary conclusions. As for us, French, we have discovered through our observatory in these days numerous stars that appeared for a while and then disappear. I know that you have also observed the same since Abdullah ibn Aisha mentioned that some astronomers in your country saw 30 years ago a new star that reappeared every year since. We shall give Abdullah ibn Aisha a book that contains illustrations of the visible stars in the region of Paris and includes an illustration of that new star. Much as trade and science informed the correspondence, the friendship that had been established by Ibn Aisha and his entourage as well with the Jourdain family remained a priority. During his stay in Paris, Ibn Aisha had fallen in love, mahabba, not hub in Arabic, in a pure and unphysical manner with Madame Jourdain. After his return to Meknas, they exchanged letters in which both expressed love to each other within, quote, the bounds of religious law, end of quote, as Ibn Aisha affirmed. And in her letters, what she said, the love that she has for him is uh, whatever God permits, as she cautioned. So much mahabba, so much love did she have for him that she opened one letter in 25 September 1699 with the is Islamic expression, which is not necessarily not Christian, Alhamdulillahi wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi al-aliyyi al-azim. Praise be to God, there is neither strength nor succor except in the Almighty and Eternal God. Meanwhile, Ibn Aisha wrote back wishing, not in untypical Arabic manner, for God to grant her a son in her next pregnancy, which it seems God did. After giving birth, she wrote to Ibn Aisha on 21st March 1700, telling him about the sun. Quote, he is like a perfect moon. May God bless you and him. And then she continued the letter, and we have named him at his christening, Jean-Francois Abdullah Ibn Aisha Jourdain. The moor had become French, and the French moor. In the light of the above two examples from the archives, a number of observations can be drawn about Arab knowledge of Europe and Europeans. First, the Arabic information about Europeans lacks a kind of master narrative. This absence of a dominant and enduring narrative 
is in contrast to the master narratives that molded English or French accounts of the Islamic world. Most European travelers who went to North Africa, the Levant, even North America, took with them two formative traditions, the classical and the biblical. The region, the people, and the history were already narrativized for the traveler, or in North Africa for the colonist, and what he had to do was merely fill in with additional information, verify the old, or contrast the glorious past, either Greek, Roman, or Christian, with the dismal present of the Arabs and the Turks and the Indians. The traveler went with a formidable and prestigious narrative in a manner that no Arab traveler to France or Russia or England ever did, excepting perhaps to Spain. Further, the Arabic writings about Western Europe and Europeans, both from Christian and Muslim pens, remained confined to personal observations and accounts. They did not contain the kind of logistical information and area surveys that Ferdinand Brodel, for instance, could have used in his study of the Christian Islamic world of the early modern Mediterranean. Secondly, Arabic sources furnish empirical descriptions that, importantly, did not include deliberate misrepresentations. They do not feature the concept of, or the term for the other, al-akhar. Stefan Todorov, building on Edward Said and also on Mary Louise Pratt, defined the concept as the manner in which one society objectifies and silences another society, seeing or gazing at it intrusively to develop an archive of knowledge that could be used in surveillance, control, and conquest. Muslims and Christians of the East, as many episodes reveal, resented such a manner of European gazing. One example. In Istanbul of 1673, some Frenchmen wandered into the court of judicature. When the judge, so it's a kind of Muslim court in, in Istanbul, when the judge asked them what business they had, I quote, they, presuming upon the innocence of their curiosity, answered they only came to see, which put him, the judge, into a fit of passion. What, said he, do you take us for monkeys, which show tricks that you come here to gaze and stare upon us? Whereupon they were thrown out. And of course, this antipathy to gazing can be credited to a unique kind of religi religiosity. Early modern European travelers, Spanish and Portuguese, French and English, meticulously collected information about the regions and peoples they visited, initiating thereby an initial form of anthropology or ethnography. This mode of surveillance and reconnaissance became part of their mindset regarding all descriptions of lands and people. That is why when Francis Bacon urged his readers to travel in his famous essay on travel, of travel, kind of 1625, he directed them to examine and subsequently write about the following, about the following, quote, foreign shipping and navies, houses and gardens of state and pleasure, armories, arsenals, magazines, exchanges, verses, warehouses, exercises, horsemanship, fencing, training of soldiers, and the like, end of quote. The traveler was to be a spy, collecting and recording empirical data, replicating for Bacon the work of the scientist in moving from particulars to generals. Meanwhile, Arab travelers went into the world with a very different goal. A traveler who was a contemporary with Francis Bacon, but from Morocco, Ibn al-Malih, who was writing in 1630-33, encouraged travel but for a different goal. Go, he addressed his reader, in imitation of the prophet Moses, who, according to one of the sayings of the prophet Muhammad, sought trade and more enlightenment and precepts. Ru'yat al go and learn morality in a sense. The traveler was to note rivers and mountains, peoples and dynasties, but all in order to praise God. The Muslim traveled subspecies eternitatis, in search of the eternal, not the temporal. Thirdly, in the early modern period, Arab Islamic writings about Europe all belong to the, to the, to the Maghreb. Uh, 
while the Arab Christian writings belong to the Mashra, to the Middle East. The difference is explained by the absence of native Christian communities west of Egypt. And it is this difference that determined the distinct character of the accounts. Christian Arabic writings were not official documents written in the corridors of Ottoman power, as were the accounts in the Arab Islamic countries, which were produced nearly always by emissaries or ambassadors with specific treaties or crises to negotiate. The writings of the Christian Arabs complement the Arab Islamic material and furnish an additional source of information about the unique early modern intersection. For they present Eastern writers who shared religious belief with the European Westerners, but not cultural identity, doctrines, but not history, nor geography. And so, going back to our priest and our ambassador. The two men engaged Euro-Christians without imposing an imperial gaze or a silencing otherness. Arabs talked, translated, and listened. They disputed and argued, fell in love and admired, wondered and declaimed. Their views were not predetermined by the absolutes of religious or jurisprudential determinations, but stemmed from their quotidian engagement and encounter. There were responses and reactions to actions and deeds and not to historical events and memories, and so ever-changing and ever-adjusting. But ultimately, and whatever was to be said or written about the Europeans could not defy the teachings of faith. The Quran had celebrated human diversity. Quote, had God wished, he could have made you all one ummah. Surah Al-Nahl, a verse that explained difference in ethnicity, gender, and culture. God, in his wisdom, wrote the Moroccan historian and court strike, a scribe, Abu Faris Abdul Aziz Al-Fishtali in 1593, quote, God, in his wisdom, elevated humankind by creating them in the best manner. He then distributed among them the beauty of features and the elegance of form, which his power had created and his wisdom had devised. He made these features differ in quantity and quality, so that there was the white and the brown and the black skin, the serene and the pugnosed, the tall, the medium, and the short. And of course, the attitude to the European was determined by geography, demography, and history and not by a structural paradigm that was unnegotiable or fixed. For among Europeans, Muslims, and Eastern Christian Arabs discovered many, many Europeans and many Europes. And, those, and what those Europeans had done or not done determined how they were to be viewed. Perhaps no episode can better conclude such openness of attitude than an episode in Morocco in the early 17th century. After the Spaniards of Al Jadida, as again, uh, agreed to a truce with the Muslims of Azamur, the wife of the Spanish military commander went out with her lady companions to visit, as she calls, the Arabs. The latter welcomed her and presented her with food, including poultry, milk, and eggs. The wife was so happy that she told her husband to take his soldiers to the field and yalab to sport with the soldiers of the Muslims. It would be great entertainment to her, she explained. So the two religious groups of the Christian Muslim frontier met and sported together as she and her Moroccan hosts watched and watched each other. Thank you so much. Uh, we, have, we have approximately 30 minutes for a question and answer session. Please uh, go ahead. Please get a microphone first before you ask a question. Microphones will be on both sides of the lecture hall. Hi. Hello. I, I followed your last little comment about meeting where the, the Moors and the Spanish met at the behest of the French or the Spanish, the wife of the Spanish military officer. But what did you mean? What were they doing when they were watching them? 
I, we don't have, I mean, the, the account ends there. But this the point is for, that, This is what leaves it something yeah, to the I, imagination. Uh, I think they were eating. I mean, that was oh, okay. the emphasis of the passage is that uh, the Spaniards were, it seems, beleaguered for food. And when they arrived there, they found that at least they were being offered poultry and milk, et cetera, which they didn't have. So I think it was a food element that would have been extremely central to them. But what they were doing beyond that, I don't know. A, a second question I have is you briefly mentioned that the way the British and the Dutch treated the areas where they went was very different than the French. And well, that's the French letter. Uh, in other words, that's how the French wanted to present themselves to the Moroccan. And um, would you consider that the, the primary reason why today in the world there is seems to be more conflict where the British were more involved than where the French were? Wow. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think if you want to look historically in terms of regions which had been colonized by Britain, uh, from Cyprus to Palestine to India, yes. I mean, by the end of the 1940s, all these will begin, will, will actually break up and result in horrendous civil wars, or internal wars rather than civil wars, uh, which, yes, did not take place in former French colonies. But then I don't, you know, I mean, we've had the massacres in the 1990s. Uh, so I don't know if we can, I mean, I think each colonial model built uh, a structure of polarization within its colonized societies that would explode either sooner or later. I think in the British cases, it was sooner. I would imagine the French cases, it's later. But uh, I don't know. I mean, that would be very difficult. Because then we have to look at basically all of Africa. All of, I mean, all the region from Morocco all the way to India was colonized by chiefly Britain and France. I mean, Italy had you know, Libya and Ethiopia, but it was Britain and France. So it's a huge kind of geographical area, each with its own character and historic development. But in a way, I think they, the seeds of polarization were definitely uh, established there or planted there. How and when they basically blossomed into conflict, uh, I would imagine varies. I was struck by your, um, your comments on the uh, attitude of the traveler to Russia. Uh, what was his name? Bura? Boulos. Boulos. Paul. Yes. That um, he, took, he had such an, an admiring view of the Russians. And having read some of the travel logs by English and Western European travelers, of the same period to Russia, they talk about the, the barbarism, barbarism. Of, of Russia, exactly. They contrast such a contrast here of the uh, Antioch uh, account that is so, uh, that elevates the status of Russia and the Western European and the English who sort of denigrate the status at the same time, coming from very different points of view and looking for different things and seeing such very different things about that. Can you uh, account for, uh, comment that's on good, that? That's a very good question. And I mean, it's always interesting to mention that, you know, he's writing just about the same time that John Milton is writing about Russia as well. So your point is absolutely correct. I mean, in terms of not just Milton's view of Russia, but even the whole historical trajectory of travelers to Russia from England and Western Europe. Yes, they're always by far more negative. Uh, I would say there are two reasons for that. First is that as an Orthodox, he would have had much more access to a wide variety of exposures than a Protestant coming from England. I mean, there already was a kind of separation that would keep him out. And that was kind of not uncommon within all the religious societies. For instance, if he went to, as he did, for instance, he goes to Mount Sinai, the uh, Convent of St. Catherine, because he's Orthodox, he's seen, he, he's, you know, he's shown the relics, etc. While if you're an Englishman or anybody else, you don't even get close to them. So he had that extra factor that uh, allowed him to be more intimate and more understanding, or given Putin to be, become more intimate understanding of the Russians. Uh, 
And second of all, of course, you know, these are his co-religionists. I mean, he is, uh, you know, he's going there to ask for money. He sees, uh, you know, potential for help and assistance, which is what he wants. So, I mean, you know, he clearly admires them for that and, uh, and is, would write favorably of them. But I think the first element is really something very distinctive about nearly all travelers, is that once you get travelers who are of the same religious identity, then they have by far more access. And whether, you know, with Catholics, for instance, they're the only ones, it's the only one who would go to America as a Catholic. So th there was this advantage that they had. And in his case, definitely, it was there over and beyond, uh, you know, the non-Orthodox travelers. But it's a good point. So I just had a quick question about both of the items that you spoke about, both the travelogue and the letters, these are items that were, that were not published in any form, right? These were like pr really private documents, okay. Yeah. Um, so I had a question about um, some of the traditions of, uh, of encyclopedic writing. I'm sure that you know in many European countries, um, this, the, the early modern period, uh, it's a very, very active time for producing cosmographies, these sort of very encyclopedic works that really cover everything from geography and cultural practices and um, flora and fauna, et cetera, and a mix of completely fantastic, wrong information uh, in addition to more recent, uh, may, maybe more empirically accurate information. And um, so I'm curious to know if in among um, Arabic writers, if there were if there was a similar tradition of knowledge gathering and encyclopedic um, uh, writing, and, and if there was or was not interest in sort of global perspective, other regions and other other peoples, the, the only the only work that I know of that I have not read much of is is uh, Ibn Khaldun's work, but he does is not as interested in the cultural practices and regions. Okay, uh, in terms of the period I'm discussing, there is no text that attempts to do that. There is, I mean, there are chronologies, there are chronicles, but they're very specific to regions. Or you have biographical dictionaries which focus on individuals, although they could be from the whole range of the Islamic world, uh, but the focus would be on their lives, activities, etc. On the other hand, I mean, what you're looking for is widely available in the medieval period. I mean, that's where Arab historians uh, and, and basically encyclopedias would write about the whole world, as far as they could know. Uh, the maps that have survived from the medieval period, again, depicted the whole world. They're following Ptolemy, but they're thinking of it. And travelers, you know, even if they did not travel to these parts, would write about the rest of the world. I think the most famous, of course, is Idrisi's map in the kind of, uh, he died in 1166, so 12th century. I mean, Idrisi kind of lived in Sicily. I mean, in, his famous book, The Book of Roger, and the map that accompanied that, is an encyclopedia of the world as it was known then. It's a very, very sophisticated range of knowledge, uh, notwithstanding the fact that he did not leave. He did not travel. But he would meet travelers and pilgrims and basically grill them for information, and then kind of designed uh, a map as well as a description of the world that's pretty advanced for the 12th century. I mean, if you compare that with the kind of maps that there were in England or France, I mean, it's by far more detailed uh, than, than anything else. Furthermore, um, there, are, uh, there are geographers who, again, because of the contacts of Muslims with India, with China, with kind of, you know, Eastern Asia, and these were totally unknown to the Europeans. And so in the 16th and 17th century, when they're building when the Europeans are beginning to build their trading uh, contacts there, they don't know anything. And so they turn to these Arab historians uh, for, for translation. I mean, the one famous one is Abul Faraj, who, again, is a medieval uh, geographer. But even in the 17th century, he was still being quoted and cited. And what's interesting is that when they translated his text uh, and printed it, uh, he writes, you know, he wrote a huge encyclopedia about the world, and there's one unit which, in which they were very interested, which was the region of India. And he called it the region beyond the river, Mawara and Nahrain, you know, beyond the Euphrates, beyond, the, beyond basically Mesopotamia. And the Latin didn't even have a term to translate that. They thought that was a proper noun. 
So actually in Latin, it is Mawara and Nahrain. It's written in Latin. So in the medieval period, I would say there was quite a very, very serious attempt to do that. In this period, there is, uh, and that is a big question as to why it's not there. Uh, the Ottomans, you know, by the early 18th century will begin to do that, but that's the Ottoman tradition. They're writing in, in Turkish, not in Arabic. And obviously they have a different perspective because it's an imperial administration, unlike the Arabs who were basically subject, uh, subjects to the Ottomans. So the answer is no, there is nothing like that. I mean, the last would be Leo Africanos, but he writes in Italian. And so, I mean, you know, I don't know where he fits into that picture, but he does that. But he writes it for Pope Leo, and so it's really an Italian work, if you want, rather than Arabic work. Earlier, you talked about um, Frenchmen traveling to Turkmenistan to see a court. Were they trying to find the similarities and or differences between Christian and Muslim uh, court systems, or were they just there as tourists? Uh, good point. Uh, they went not as tourists. I mean, there was no tourism for a Muslim into a Christian country. They had to have permission, they had to have ships to carry them, and there, there had to be a very, very strong reason. So they went there for to negotiate uh, treaties and political issues, and sometimes captives. But your point about whether they were willing or they contrasted or compared courts is actually quite interesting, because you know they're very impressed with the courts, they're very impressed with the whole infrastructure, they're very impressed with the fact that you have such a layer of hierarchy and everybody's being paid, unlike what I guess seemed to have been the case for them. They didn't get paid. But what's interesting is that there is one traveler at the end who's an ambassador as well, at the end of the 18th century, again Morocco, who uh, goes to Turkey. Uh, he goes to Spain, he goes to Sicily, he goes to Malta. So he, go, he visits Western Europe and then he visits the Ottomans. And when he writes about that, he says these Ottomans are really imitating the French and we don't like that. Uh, in a sense that he sees that the way his court in Morocco is being conducted is very different, and that these Ottomans are really kind of lining themselves up with the, with the French. And the worst thing that he noticed is that, you know, the Turks always drink coffee. This is kind of something that he had nothing to do with. So it's kind of interesting that by the end of the 18th century, Moroccans were not drinking coffee. So. You're looking at a period of time that is sort of early modern, or, or is that what you're calling it, early modern? And how do you think that this reflects to a more modern period? Do you, or is it, I mean, is it a basis for how we look at the more modern period of the Europe, Europeans and the Arabs? Or is it simply a reflection of a time that may or may not have anything to do with a more modern period? More of the time, because as I say, with the arrival of Napoleon, uh, things will change dramatically. I mean, at this point, as I mentioned to the young gentleman here, uh, you know, you're, uh, a North African or an Easterner could not travel to Europe, I mean, unless they were given assistance, etc. By the early 19th century, there's a lot of travel. Uh, it's also kind of encouraged by the French, by the British, because they want to show off what they've got, and they want to recruit uh, kind of, you know, possible agents, possible uh, counterparts in their negotiations. So. By that time, it becomes a very different experience, that uh, there is more knowledge. People are writing more about Western Europe. They're more aware of its social structures than this. And then, more importantly, they're getting, you know, they begin to be printed and therefore kind of being read in Egypt, in Lebanon, in Syria. So there's more information that's being disseminated. As I mentioned, I mean, when a Moroccan ambassador writes, he writes for the court. So. The court reads what he writes. His ruler reads what he writes. Maybe outside the court, there is some kind of reverberations of what is written, but it remains confined. So there is a difference in the sense that by the modern period, there's much more information available on what is going on there. And you know, it, it becomes more of a challenge because they become much less capable of confronting the economic strength of these countries, particularly France and Britain. Uh, much less able to confront their economic strength than they could. Whether it bears any, uh, whether it has any bearing on today's perceptions, 
I think it's very difficult to say that, simply because I say it becomes a very, very different range of exposures. I mean, this is an area, this is a period when they're still trying to find information. And because perhaps they don't have the printing press, because they can't travel as much as they want, they, they love to travel. It's just that they weren't able to make it. Uh, because of that, because of the dangers of the sea, I mean, you know, again for them, it was kind of pretty scary. Uh, you know, they don't have that kind of information. In the modern period, obviously, information is widely available. As I say, by the 19th century, it begins to change. And that's why I would say it becomes a very different kind of experience altogether. Holton Main from Richard. So somebody's been watching you live on the internet. And the question is, in the Arab world in that time period, what status did the Oriental Orthodox so-called monophysite churches have? Uh, the Monophysites are chiefly Jacobites and the Coptic Church, although there is some Copts would not like to think of themselves as being Monophysite. I mean, they have their autonomy as an ecclesiastical community and religious community. Uh, I mean, I don't know what further to say, I mean, in that respect, because, uh, you know, it's, it's a community that has been there for, you know, since the beginning. Uh, in the period I look at, I mean, maybe I can talk better about that. It's very interesting. They're very active in terms of intellectual work, in terms of theological work. Uh, there are numerous texts. I mean, this is part of the project I have, is to look at the Arabic writings of the Eastern Christians, because they're, you know, it's incredible to think that, you know, notwithstanding the Ottoman conquest, notwithstanding the Tur Turkification of administration, Arabic remains the language of the Eastern Christians as the language of, you know, not necessarily completely the church, but definitely the language of, of discourse, the language of writing. And there are numerous, numerous texts. Uh, what is interesting about those texts is that they're always arguing against each other. So the Jacobites are attacking the Armenians, the Armenians are attacking the Copts, the Copts are attacking the Catholics. It's really very much an internal conflict of theologies. And you know, I, I mean, there was one text which was so elegantly written uh, somewhere in the, uh, towards the end of the 16th century. It's you know, beautiful pagination, very large script, uh, you know, with colors so that you notice where the beginning of the chapters are. And it's all about the nature of the Trinity. And you're wondering, what is this guy in Aleppo doing? You know, arguing against clearly the Catholic position. Uh, because Orthodox and Catholic differ on the interpretation of the Trinity. One is through the procession of the Holy Spirit. The other is with, you know, God and uh, Father and Son versus Father to Son. I mean, there's this long theological discussion going on at the end of the 16th century in Aleppo. Uh, who, you know, who or what or why is that coming through? As I say, I find that fascinating, that, that kind of intellectual theological intensity is still there. So the communities, as far as my period is concerned, were very active and very productive in that respect. And I think that's an area that needs to be further studied in terms of what they have left behind. Anybody else? Oh, we have a question. Well, it looks like we're running out of questions, Nabil. I, uh, if the Turks had come to Morocco around the same time period, they had found Moroccans drinking tea, green tea, uh, which was introduced to Morocco by the British. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> Thank you so much. Now we're going to move on to the next phase of our little celebration. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry about this. <laughs> I hope.